the boyfriend and I moved out. Eventually, my father got a new girlfriend who moved in. She has two kids. One is my father's and one by another man. They were young at this time, the girl being around five and the boy being about two. After a while, the girlfriend started talking to me and saying that there was something off with the house. She did know the story about the previous owner. Her daughter stayed in my old room, you know, the one with the posters, also the one with the closet. Her daughter started talking about an old man named Zabu that lived in the closet. She described him as an old man with a long beard and said that he glowed green. She said that she'd seen him a few times and that she didn't like him or the closet. One time the boy was sitting on the living room floor, looking up at the ceiling, and just randomly out of nowhere he says, I don't want to talk to you right now. Nobody was speaking with him, or even close to him. I'm sure there was more involving them, but I can't remember all of it right now. Weird things kept happening though. At the time, I'd even asked a paranormal investigation team if they would be interested in looking at the house. Of course, they were all for it, but we first had to get permission from the owner of the house, which would be my dad. When my dad's girlfriend brought it up to him, he declined, saying that there's no such thing as ghosts and he didn't want a bunch of strangers staying in the house. So, regretfully, I had to inform the team of this decision. Flash forward to a few years later. She and my father broke up and she moved out. He got a new job where he was rarely home. I have two children by now, so I decided, you know what, I'll rent the house while he's gone. My boyfriend and I and our two kids moved in. The first thing that happened was later one night. I was in the basement, and the lights were quite dim down there, and I heard something rustling around in one of the two bedrooms. I opened the door, and the light wouldn't come on. Nothing strange, just a blown light bulb. But as I was looking around the room for possible rodents, I looked up at the ceiling and there was a flashing green and reddish orange light. Then I realized that they were everywhere. The closest thing I can compare it to is the flashing light you might see on a smoke alarm. There were hundreds of these lights all over the ceiling. So I backed right out and closed the door as quickly as I could and vacated the basement altogether. Those lights started to randomly appear on the ceiling in the main part of the basement too. My sister and her boyfriend came to visit. Once again, we were in the basement. We smoked down there instead of upstairs. It was getting late. Her boyfriend went and opened the car bay door from inside the house. He was going to go outside to use the bathroom, as it was much easier for him and he didn't want to go upstairs and wake my kids unnecessarily. So as he's heading through the car bay, we hear, What the f***? He turned around and hightailed it back out of there, slamming the door. Obviously panicked, he then proceeded to tell us that he had just seen a little girl running across the room from one end to the other. We opened up the door and checked things out, but nothing was there. One night after dark, I was in a bedroom upstairs, not my old room. Nobody was staying in that one. In my daughter's room, the one adjacent to my old room, I was putting some laundry away. When out of the blue, my daughter, who was about three or four at the time, pointed at the window. She said, Mom, who's the man standing outside? I looked at the window. She's still pointing and looking at it. Trying my best not to panic, I said, Babe, there's no man out there. I didn't see anything. No man. It was completely dark. There also wasn't a man inside the room, nor in the reflection of the inside of the room on the darkened window. But if she could see it, I sure couldn't. As calmly as I could, with a racing heart and clammy hands, I picked her up and left the laundry. I brought her out to the living room, where I then asked her about the man she saw. She said he was really tall and had a beard. Remember Zabu? Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I made sure to have the curtains closed and her bedroom door opened at all times after that. 
Another day, I was in the living room, playing Guitar Hero, sitting in a chair not too far from the television. It was night, and my kids were in bed. So, while I was into the game and focused on all the colors and playing, I saw a little girl out of the corner of my eye, standing a few feet away from me. I assumed it was my daughter who had gotten out of bed to use the bathroom. So I then proceeded to talk to her and ask her why she was up. I asked her if she could go back to bed, or if she was thirsty or hungry, but I got no replies. My song was over and I could still see this girl out of the corner of my eye. So I looked directly at her and there was nobody there. The daughter I thought I'd been carrying on a one-sided conversation with was still in her bed, completely sound asleep. I was in shock. There was no way. But alas, apparently now we have a Zabu and a little girl hanging around. One morning, it was early. I was in the basement doing laundry. My children's dad at the time was sitting on the couch with our daughter. The couch was in front of a built-in bar area, 70s style. There was fluorescent lighting all over it, but it didn't work. So we had a small table lamp on top of the bar for lighting. The plug was behind the bar area. I had forgotten some laundry upstairs and I ran up to grab it. On my way back down the stairs, I yelled to the kid's father, Watch out, get up! The lamp that was on the bar was literally sliding across the bar and was about to fall off the edge right onto the heads of the two people sitting under it which happened to be my family. As soon as they got up, it stopped moving and stayed where it was, hovering at the edge of the bar. My father also had an old phone that was screwed into the wall in the basement. It was very old, probably put in when the house was originally built. He just never bothered to take it out. It had a rotary dial too. For all the young ones, that's a phone where you actually have to turn the dial to the number you want. No touch numbers here. We didn't have a landline hooked up, as seven to eight years ago, cell phones were much more convenient. When we would be upstairs, that phone would randomly start ringing. Of course, it's been years since there was a landline hooked to the house, and it would only ring a couple of times before stopping, and never while anybody was downstairs. We would randomly hear scratching on the carport door, almost like a cat. This would happen when we were downstairs. It was on the inside door heading to the carport, but on the car bay side. And of course, upon investigation, there was never anything there and nothing was ever disturbed. We stayed there maybe six to seven months and moved. I'd had enough. I told my father what had been happening and once again he said I was foolish, that there's no such thing as ghosts. Fine, to each their own. He can believe whatever he wants to, or not. A few months after I moved out, I got a phone call from my father. He was kind of frantic, which was unusual. He said, I believe you now. I said, what are you talking about? I mean, it's kind of a weird way to start a phone call. He said, about the ghosts. There's, there's something in that house. I said, really? Finally, you believe me. What happened? He said that he was laying on the couch at night. He's the only one living there now, and he said that the covered doors one night started opening and slamming shut on their own. Another night, a mug had fallen out of the cupboard on its own. The taps would turn on and off on their own. He swears he saw somebody walking around outside at night, but when he turned the outside lights on and went to investigate, there was never anybody there. As a total non-believer, he shook off everything that has happened over the years as a coincidence or the product of an active imagination, right up until he saw and heard those cupboards with his own eyes and ears. He was quite shaken up. He left again for work, and he did rent the house out to a few different people. He even warned them about the house, and there was only one of the renters out of the two who admitted to him that they too had heard and seen some pretty weird stuff. He never elaborated on what happened with the renters, but after the second one, he put the house up for sale. This was about five years ago, and I've always wondered what has happened in the house since. I also wonder about the stories the current owners could share. I don't know who they are, 
and I'm not about to drive up and tell them my story and ask them if anything has ever happened to them, no matter how curious I am. Although I have to admit, it's mighty tempting. When I was around nine, a few of my cousins came to sleep over at my house. Since we couldn't all fit on my bed, we decided to sleep on the floor near the door to my bedroom and all share one giant blanket. Sometime during the night, I woke up to somebody tucking in the covers around me. I thought maybe my dad had seen us while on the way to the bathroom and maybe we had kicked off the covers as I was prone to do at the time. I opened my eyes to say something to my dad, and although I could still feel the tucking in of the blankets, there was nobody there. Nobody was tucking us in, yet I could very clearly feel the hands pushing the blanket in around me. I was in the middle of the pack, and I looked to see if any of my cousins were awake or fidgeting, and also to see if they were observing what was going on, but they were all sound asleep and motionless. My little kid logic told me to close my eyes and whatever it was would never know that I had woken up. So that's what I did. I laid there silent and still for what seemed like 10 minutes or so while I felt the blanket move as invisible hands went down the line and tucked each and every one of us in that night. It wasn't the most exciting brush with the paranormal, but since I don't remember much of my life before I was 10, it's my very first memory of anything weird like that. What's interesting is that my dad believes that there's a spirit too. He even credits it with saving my life. Something shoved him really hard once while he was standing in the yard. It shoved him so hard that he fell over. When he looked back to see who had pushed him, nobody else was in the yard. But that's when he saw me desperately trying to get his attention from the window on the second floor. I was three years old, and I was having my very first asthma attack. If he hadn't looked behind him to see what had shoved him, who knows what would have happened. Whatever it was, it eventually moved on. We lived out of the state for a few years and rented the house to one of my aunts and her family. She also saw this thing regularly while they lived there, and so did my uncle. When we moved back and they got a new place and it started appearing at their new house, it was never seen in mine again. I have so many spooky things that have happened to my family and I that it's not even funny. But by this thing, I was the most creeped out. I used to live in a haunted house for two years. I moved to another city for school and moved in with my best friend as a roommate. The whole apartment building was built in the 1800s, and as far as I know, we lived in the servant side of the apartment building. That also kind of explains why there were always things happening there, especially if we left a mess in the apartment. I really can't even detail all of the things, you would need a whole book for that, but I'll mention a few things that happened here. One thing that happened quite early on living there was that both of our tweezers went missing. We bought new ones the next day and they're absolutely nowhere to be found. Of course, we argued about this, blaming each other for the missing tweezers, but went on to buy one pair to share. And the next day they were also gone. A few days went by and we were out shopping for a few hours. When we got home, the freaking five pairs of tweezers that by now we had bought and lost were lined up on our kitchen table, right down the middle of it. We slept in the same bed that night, we were so scared. My cat used to hate that place. He became very stressed out and had a lot of hair loss issues, which never happened before or after moving in or out of there. He would also wake up from a deep sleep to hiss at the same spot many times. That spot was in a hallway in front of every door, and it was sometimes cold there. My roommate's clock would drop from the sofa or from the table right in front of us, 
or completely turn around. We both saw that happen. One time, we were at the line to a bar, and my roommate noticed that she'd left her phone at home. We lived in the middle of the center of the city, so she went to grab it. She came back really quickly and was white as a sheet. She had an automatic lock on her phone, so that after, like, two minutes of nobody touching it, it would lock up. At that point, we'd been gone for about 15 to 20 minutes, and you would also need a password to enter her phone. She went home, and in the dark living room, her phone was sitting there, unlocked. Needless to say, we also shared the bed that night as well. We had numerous accounts of waking up at night to what sounded like somebody washing dishes, or walking upstairs. We also heard sawing upstairs, and we lived on the top floor. Above us was only the attic. There were many things, and I really wish I'd written them all down, but I was just trying to live there while I was scared as hell. I'm very sensitive to things like this, and I never slept there alone. Not even one night. I was too scared. I had sleep paralysis there so many times. And, interestingly, that never happened before I moved in or after I moved out. I'm sure that we were never there alone. And for everyone wondering, no one had a key to the apartment except my roommate and I. We only had one neighbor, a young couple who lived next door, and there were only business spaces in the apartments below. To this day, we don't have any explanation for the things that happened there. When I was around 16 years old, my friends and I decided it would be fun to go out to an old abandoned farmhouse that was rumored to be haunted. We didn't really believe in ghosts at the time, but we were fascinated by the thrill of potentially experiencing something paranormal. So on a hot summer night in July, we decided to take two cars out to this abandoned farmhouse. There were six of us in total, it took about 45 minutes to drive to this place, so we left at around 2.15 a.m. because we wanted to arrive at this place by 3, ghosting hour. To get to the house, we drove down a dark, winding rural road with houses few and far between. There weren't any street lights, so although it was a warm summer night, it still felt scary as we drove through the unfamiliar place in the pitch black. As we arrived at the house, I felt nearly sick to my stomach. I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal at the time, but something in my gut just felt wrong. It all felt wrong. The house was situated at the bottom of two hills and there was no driveway in front of it. So we had to park at the top of the hill where there was an area off to the side of the road covered with crushed rock. We got there just in time to fulfill our plan of arriving at ghosting hour. As we walked down the hill, we saw the house. It basically looked exactly how you would picture an old abandoned farmhouse. Exposed gray wood, pieces of siding falling off, and overgrown plants around the entrance. There were two levels to the house. The first level had two windows on either side of the door, and the top had three windows, one to the left, one to the right, and one immediately above the door. As we walked closer to the house, we saw that the door was open, so we dared each other to go inside. We formed a line to enter the house. Two of my friends, who were guys, went in front of me, and I was the third in line to enter the house. The first guy is friend number one, and the second is friend number two. As we enter the house, I immediately felt ice cold. I have never felt that kind of cold in my life. I felt it in my bones. As soon as I felt the cold, I heard friend number one scream at the top of his lungs. It all happened so fast that I could barely make out what it looked like inside. I mostly remember an uninviting couch laid across the stairs with the living room to the left of the stairs and the kitchen to the right. It was like walking back in time. 
old floral wallpaper peeling off the walls. In the seconds after friend number one screams, we all run out of the house immediately. As I look back toward the entrance, I notice that only friend number two exited the house behind me, and friend number one was still screaming inside the house, like blood-curdling, fearful screams. Everything happened so fast. Friend number two ran back inside the house, grabbed the first friend, and pulled him out. My first friend was so scared that he ran out from the house screaming that something was holding him up in the air by his shirt. He rips off his shirt while he's running, and all I see are three big tears in the back of it. It kind of looked like three prongs from a pitchfork that had been ripped through it, but it didn't end there. As my second friend stepped foot outside the door, he starts yelling in pain. I looked back, and he had blood dripping all over his face onto his shirt. I literally felt like I was in a horror movie. He came toward me, and I was in full instinct mode. I took my sweater off and gave it to him to try to stop the bleeding. He just tells me that something hit him in the nose and he needs to get to the hospital. So we run back up the hill, which felt like it took a thousand years, and we finally get to the car. When we get in, I handed friend number two a tissue to clean up his nose, and I shined my light on it to see what was bleeding. His right nostril had a clean cut all the way through it. It looked like someone took scissors or shears and cut all the way through, and it got worse. As we're driving away, my friend and I both look back at the house, and there's a candle lit in the top left window then, as I looked to the other side of the road, there's this old trailer with a light on and the silhouette of a man with a hat in the window. I'm 100% convinced that this man was an evil spirit. Just the feeling I got off of him staring at me, watching me as I drove by. I still feel chills when I think about it. I felt like it was a warning to never come back to this property. It felt like he was the spirit that hurt both of my friends, and he was sending me a message. On the drive back, we ended up bringing my friend to the nearest ER, where they stopped the bleeding and stitched up his nose. He still has a scar from it, and his right nostril still looks dog-eared from where it split apart, and from the stitches where they healed. I will never mess around with the paranormal again. I'm 26 now, and I will never go near a haunted house or any building rumored to be haunted. I did some research about the house, and it turns out that two people died in the left top room of the house. One was by suicide, and another was a woman in childbirth. So it makes sense that there was a couch blocking the path up the stairs. Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, Come in! Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again. 
Come on in. She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there, as she was putting her clothes back on, and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it, so that was it. She quickly opened it, and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom, when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there, just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her co-workers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think. This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I have been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet, and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays. And as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work. So I turned to ask him, but when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down, and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned, and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door. I went more slowly this time. And yes, holy crap, he was still there. Now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About ten minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she's walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, oh, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very, I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while.
When I was in my teens, my father bought a house in the country. A newer house built in the 70s, I believe. Neighbors weren't too close by, except for a house right at the end of the driveway. A little background. The previous owners were a husband and a wife. The house at the end of the driveway was the mother of one of them, I can't remember which. The husband found out that he had cancer. He kept spiraling further and further into depression as the disease progressed. One day, he decided that he was done. And, as the story goes, he set up tarps in the dining room, right in front of the patio and the patio door. He shot himself. The wife proceeded to move out and the house was put up for sale. Enter my father. He buys said house. It was quite big, roomy, nice finished basement. My room was upstairs, first bedroom of three down the hallway. It was enjoyable at first. I got to decorate my new room, yay. As a teenager, I had an obscene amount of posters, pictures, and drawings that I did as decorations. I stuck them all to the wall. It didn't take very long for things to start getting weird. Now mind you, at this stage, I had no knowledge of the previous owner or the story. I would wake up like clockwork every night at about 2 a.m. Strange, but I would just roll over and go back to sleep. Then in the mornings when I would wake up, my posters on one wall, the wall with the closet, would be crooked. As a typical teenager, I would leave them crooked for a few days, and then finally straighten them, retack them, and give up. Then I started to notice that all the posters were tilted to the same exact angle, in the same direction. Definitely weird. So I ended up taping them, all four corners, with some pretty good tape, and still, the posters would fall and end up crooked, the same exact way. Eventually, I just gave up and left them that way. Remember how I said I started waking up every night at 2 a.m.? Well, it started to freak me out once I realized that it just kept happening. So I would take longer and longer to fall asleep. Then the real fun started. I started hearing footsteps. They would start at the basement stairs. I heard them come up, open the basement door, walk through the kitchen, down the hallway, past my door, turn around at the end of the hallway and proceed back the way it had come into the basement. The first time I heard this, I figured it was dad, but no, it wasn't dad because I could hear him snoring in his room. Then I panicked. In a good old fashioned way, my blankets went up over my head and I hyperventilated. I seriously thought that at some point my door would open, but it didn't. I didn't die or see any ghostly matter. But man, was I ever freaked out. I didn't sleep much the rest of the night the first time it happened, and it was hard to get much sleep at all after that. The next morning, as soon, and I mean as soon, as my father woke up, I told him what I heard. He laughed and said, okay, well, you must have been sleeping and dreamed it. He has zero belief of the paranormal, and here I am, still not having a clue about the history of the house. Okay. Okay, maybe I was dreaming. I still woke up most nights, but no footsteps. It's all right, right? Wrong. They sure did come back. At least once or twice a month, I would hear those footsteps, and I'd damn near die of a panic attack each time. But knowing that telling my father was futile after the first four to five times I tried, I gave up telling him. Mystery feet never tried to enter my room, so believe me, I was more than happy if it stayed that way. We were there maybe five to six months when my father came inside one day. The lady who lives at the end of the driveway picked blackberries in the backyard, so he was out talking with her. He came in and said, Okay, I have something to tell you. I was like, okay? Little old lady wanted me to go make pies with her or something like that? But no. He proceeded to tell me about the history of the house. He said that the lady had seen lights come on in the dining room a few times, but it was when nobody was home. She's convinced it's her deceased family member still lingering. I was thinking, yes, he finally accepted that something weird is going on here. 
but nope. Then he went up and checked the wiring and everything was fine, so he laughed at me and the lady for having really good imaginations. Now, no lights ever went on and off by themselves while I was home, but random doors would open and close on their own. Drafts, right? My father thought so too. Me? Not so much. The laundry room was in the basement. I hated it down there. Always got some serious heebie-jeebies and felt like somebody was always watching me. Then it felt like somebody was pushing or nudging me down the stairs while I was walking down them, and I really started to dislike it there. Flash forward a year or so, I had a boyfriend after a while who started staying the night. Curious, after a while, my boyfriend said, hey, how come all your posters are crooked? I sighed and said, because no matter what I do, they always end up crooked in the morning, so I just leave them that way. He said, no way. So, me being me, I went out and got the best packing tape I could find. I told him to start helping me tape every single corner of every single picture and to make sure they're straight. I told him to make sure he was satisfied that there's no way they could fall off. We got it done. Our mission was complete. I asked him to make sure to remember that these pictures were straight before we went to bed. He said, yep, they're straight. And when we woke up, they weren't. He damn near shit himself. He couldn't believe it. But alas, teen picture-hating ghosty struck again. So finally realizing that I've got someone who half-ass thinks something weird is going on, I fill him in on everything else that's happened there. He said I absolutely had to wake him up when I heard these footsteps. Well, oddly enough, every time I did hear them, I tried. Oh, how I tried to wake him. But no way was he waking up. No matter what I did, he wouldn't wake. I even bit him once just to see if that would work. Still kept sleeping, like nothing had ever happened. One day, he and I were sitting in the living room. We had these big wooden basement doors that were underneath the patio, and they opened up to a little garage, big enough to park your car in. They shook so hard that we could feel it vibrating the living room floor. It was loud. It sounded like two people at least were banging and shaking these doors. A pheasant even took off flying at the same time because it was scared. We jumped up, obviously thinking that somebody was trying to break into the house. We ran outside to look, but there was no one, and I mean no one there, except two freaked out teenagers and a pheasant that I'm pretty sure had a heart attack. It was a wide open field. There was nobody anywhere. We would have seen them somewhere trying to make their escape. And keep in mind, the shaking was still going on while we were out there, so we would have seen who was doing it. Obviously, we told my dad when he got home, and it was more, ah, you guys are crazy, statements. My dad had this old wooden rocking chair in the corner of the dining room. After a while, this thing started rocking on its own. I told dad. He bought a rug for underneath it and said it was those darn drafts again. Nope, that thing would still rock. But of course, it never did it when my father was around. Not too long after that, my boyfriend and I got an apartment of our own and moved out. But trust me, that's not where the story ends. This is my experience from Jekyll Island Beach Club a hotel that I now know is quite infamous for being haunted and frequented by ghost hunters. I've lived in Georgia my entire life. We traveled all around the state growing up, going to conferences that my mother attended for her job. I was around nine years old on this particular trip, so it was about 2003. It was just me, my father, and my mother. We still like to share these stories at family gatherings, and I figured that somebody else might appreciate them too. I will preface this by saying that I was an extremely independent and resourceful child, so my parents let me do my thing on these types of trips and make friends with the other kids also in attendance. 
So don't get your panties in a bunch about me being left alone in the hotel room for a couple of hours or being allowed to run around the resort with my buds. When we arrived at the hotel, our room immediately creeped us out. Upon opening the door, there was a staircase leading up to our suite. It was spacious, with a dining room, king-sized bed, and wall partially separating the bedroom from a living room area with a pull-out couch. We were just chilling, exhausted from our drive, when we heard the sound of a door creaking open. We looked to our right, and the door to what we assumed was the closet was ajar. It wasn't a closet. It was a brick wall. My family and I are Diet Coke fanatics. I used to pound them, even if they were room temperature. Disgusting, I know. After the door incident, I figured I needed a little caffeine, so I went to open a Diet Coke from a 12-pack that we'd bought coming in. Completely flat. Well, that's weird. I tried to open another. Completely flat. Curious. The next day, we tried to open one from the 12-pack we'd left in the car, and it was totally fine. Something had been draining the energy, in this case I guess the carbonation, from all of our belongings. My mom had a sweet blackberry at the time. I used to play that little game where you bounce the ball off that little bar that goes back and forth. You know what I'm talking about. Her blackberry had been charging since we got there and was all the way charged. After the door and the unsuccessful attempt at having a Diet Coke, I figured I would just play a little of that game. I unplugged it, plopped down on the couch, and as soon as I opened the damn game, I watched the battery completely drain and die. No electronics that we brought on that trip would hold a charge. Everything would die as soon as we came into the suite. Later on, sunburned and reminiscing on my day boogie boarding, my parents left me in the suite to go hit up the conference's reception. I whipped out my markers and started drawing when I heard the toilet, which was on the other side of the wall separating my pull-out couch from the master, flush. All right, that's weird. I decided to lay in my parents' bed and watch the toilet to see what the hell was going on. About 15 minutes later, I watched, wide-eyed, as the handle on the toilet went down and it happened again. My nine-year-old brain was trying to make logical sense of this. I was freaked out, but not frightened. I do believe to this day that they were friendly ghosts. I decided to migrate back to my pull-out bed. Another 30 minutes go by and I've chalked it up to being nothing. And then it does it again, followed by the laughter of what sounded like children my age. I rolled over and covered my head until my parents got back. The next night, I was on my pull-out bed playing possum and pretending to sleep whilst pondering all the strange shit that had gone down. It was about 11.30 p.m. That's when I started hearing footsteps above us. It sounded like several people were running above the room. Problem was, we were on the top floor. My parents, who think I'm asleep, start freaking out and whispering, holy shit, back and forth. Then, there was a knock at our door. My dad yelps and my mom bursts out laughing at his reaction. They go down the staircase together to answer the door like two teenagers. They still think I'm asleep. It was a hotel security dude who says, We've received several complaints about kids playing up here. Can you please tell your children to keep it down as our guests are trying to sleep? My parents respond with, We only have one kid and she's asleep upstairs. He responds with, Oh. Listen, I'm going to be honest, I can't say this is the first time something like this has happened. The next day, my mom was in some workshops, and I wanted to hit up the pool and chill with some of my friends. The same group of kids always showed up to these conferences. Our parents are all judges, senators, legislators, or lobbyists. While I was at the pool, my dad decided to play a round of golf. At one point, I tried to go back to the room real quick to get something. I whipped out my room key, which was a literal key, but I couldn't get the door open. I went to the front desk and an employee walked me back to the room to try to let me in. It turned out the deadbolt, the ones in hotel rooms that can only be locked from the inside, had somehow been placed. Not exaggerating, they ended up having to take the door off the hinges so my family and I could get back in. Up until this point, all of these occurrences were just weird, and none of them were particularly frightening. There were only two days left of the trip, 
I fell asleep that night with no issue, but I woke up to what felt like somebody was getting onto the pull-out bed. I thought it was just my mom or dad, so I rolled over. But no one was there. Alright, now I'm actually feeling trepidation. I slam my eyes shut, but I have a distinct feeling that somebody is watching me. I laid motionless for probably an hour, afraid to move or call out to my parents, who were asleep on the other side of the wall. Then, a loud bang. One of those noises that jolts you and reflexively forces your eyes open. There was a tall figure, probably at least eight feet, at the foot of my bed in a black hood. I couldn't see its face. I started screaming and hid under the covers. My parents rushed over, comforting me as I'm crying and terrified. We then all three heard a laugh, this time of an adult, followed by loud footsteps overhead. I was done after this, and so were my parents. We packed up our stuff and left in the middle of the night, and my mom missed the last day of the conference. I still see some of the friends that I made on those trips, and they all have their own stories from that particular conference at Jekyll Island Beach Club. One of them, a judge's son, had lucked out and gotten to stay out in the lighthouse suite. He and his father had taken us to see it, and it was incredible. Spiral staircase leading up to the top where the actual suite was. His stories of our time spent at the resort are the most terrifying. Needless to say, I will never go back. My mom recently had a conference there and refused to stay on the resort grounds, opting to stay at another hotel down the road. For context, this was in October or November of 2019 in Chile at the start of a social uprising. I mention this because a common way of demonstrating here is a toma of a school. Basically, a bunch of students locked themselves in the school for a long time, meaning we had to stay the night. We stayed mostly by the front door and what I will call the back hallway, where we kept watch at night. These were separated by two open playgrounds where kids would roam around in the day and things like that. The first thing that happened was on the second or third night, a few kids and I were keeping watch at the back hallway. It's also the oldest one, just a hallway of classrooms with most of them locked. One of the guys started to bang on the doors of the locked classrooms to see if anything happened. In pure teenager fashion, we were hoping that something would. In one or two of them, we heard banging from inside. That's when we got more excited than scared, actually. After that, it was common to hear banging and things moving inside the classrooms, even though we knew nobody was there. A lot of things happened, but I'm just going to share the things that scared me the most. Two girls came to the front door area to tell us that they were walking around and heard really loud noises in one of the classrooms in the back hallway, like chairs and desks moving. A group of us went to check what had happened. The first classroom that happened to be unlocked was a mess. Chairs and desks were scattered and some were turned over. It looked like a scene out of a horror movie. We thought maybe somebody was just pranking us, but the girls said that nobody was in that area of the school except for them. And the classroom ended up being the most active one, so I don't know. It became common practice between the kids that wanted to be haunted, me included, to check all of the unlocked classrooms in the back hallway at the start and end of our shifts just to see if anything moved, letting the active one stay for last. One of the times while we were doing that, one guy decided that that was the perfect time to tie his shoelaces while we were in that most active room. First, we heard banging on the ceiling. We started to get scared and told him to hurry up, but for some reason, he seemed to be having a hard time with these laces. Then we heard a small bang on the wall, followed by a loud one. It sounded like a giant had thrown a punch the window even vibrated. We booked it to the front door where the other people were. We didn't even turn the lights off. Then we tried to go back, but we noticed that now the light was off. We just stared. And then loud sounds came from the classroom again. We didn't go back. The last story is my favorite. My then partner, I'll call him Adam, our friend, I'll call him Derek, and I went to the back hallway with the intention of experiencing something. 
One of the guys, I'll call him Joe, followed us trying to be sneaky and scare us, but we noticed him. We walked through the hallway and heard stuff, but we obviously just blamed it on Joe. We were cursing him and stuff when Adam said that they saw someone peek out of the active classroom. Assuming it was just Joe, we went and screamed at him from outside that it wasn't funny and things like that. Adam even started to kick the wall of the classroom from outside. And that's when we heard kicking from the inside. Fed up with it, we just opened the door and threw the lights on. It was empty. We went in and looked around and just stood there dumbfounded. I was facing the inside while Adam and Derek faced me, which means they were also facing the door. At that point, one of the desks moved by itself. I saw it. It looked like someone had pushed it with force, but nobody was there. Nobody was even near that desk. We booked it again and we screamed and cursed and almost tripped over each other a few times. We were scared. It felt angry, whatever this thing was. Whatever lived there almost always felt friendly. But this time, not so much. Joe arrived at the front door a few minutes later and told us that he did follow us, but he didn't even get a chance to do anything before the real activity started. A few years back, I was working as a music teacher at a primary school in Manchester. The building was quite old, and I had been told that it was used as a hospital during World War II. How true this is, I'm not sure. I've always believed in the paranormal after witnessing many things growing up in my parents' house. Because I live quite a distance from the school, to avoid traffic, I would leave for work at about 5.45 a.m. If I did that, I'd be into work at about 6.30 a.m., but if I left 15 minutes later, I'd be stuck on the motorway for two hours. It was crazy, but I got my preparation done before most teachers got in, and I could relax. I was the first person apart from the cleaners in the school, and it was usually dark in the morning, but I never felt or sensed anything or felt scared. My music equipment room was downstairs in the basement and here I'd have to go down two flights of stairs and switch the lights on as it was pitch black. You went down the stairs and at the bottom there was an old toilet room immediately to the bottom left. This was mostly used for storage now. The only other way to go was down a small corridor to the right. Halfway down was my room, and at the end was the art storeroom. In the morning, sometimes I'd go down to my room and play drums before getting my equipment for the first lesson. I never heard or saw anything during that time. One lunchtime, I was in the music room and I needed to use the restroom, so I went to use the one in the basement that was used for storage. I mean, it worked after all. As I was flushing the toilet, I heard high-heeled shoes walking down the stairs. I was washing my hands and I popped my head out to check who it might be, and I clearly saw a woman with her hair in a bun, a two-piece tweed type jacket and skirt walking toward my room. I dried my hands and went to see what the person, who I was sure with how she was dressed was the deputy head, wanted me for. I walked into my room expecting to see her, but nobody was there. I thought she must have gone to the art room, so I walked the short distance and opened that door. Again, there was nobody there. There was one way in and one way out of the basement, and nobody came back past me. I must admit I was a little bit scared. I checked again, but nobody was there. I went upstairs, and that's where the deputy head's office was. I popped in and asked her if she'd been down to the basement, but she said she hadn't, and she clearly wasn't wearing tweed, and she didn't have her hair in a bun. I went to the staff room and said to a colleague and a friend that I thought I'd seen a ghost. I described what I'd seen, and she told me to go tell a specific member of the staff. I went and I told this teacher that I thought I had seen a ghost. He immediately asked me, if she was wearing a two-piece tweed jacket and skirt, and had her hair in a bun. I was shocked. He told me that he had seen her in the second floor hall outside of his classroom on a few occasions when he was working late. I was also told that the caretaker and some other cleaners had seen her as well. Safe to say it took me a while to venture down to the basement first thing in the morning to play drums for some time. 
I've had many other experiences at my parents' and friends' houses, but this is the only actual full apparition that I've ever seen to date. My parents bought the house we're currently living in two years ago. It has four levels, not stories, just levels. When you enter the house or main floor, to your left are the stairs that lead to upstairs, quote unquote. Next to those stairs are the ones that take you downstairs and to the left of those are the basement stairs. We live in Arlington, Texas. We moved into this house in the summer of 2017. Before we moved in, we would stay the weekends and paint the house. We stayed in Fort Worth on the weekdays so we could continue school. After our first night of staying here, I had a nightmare that a little boy was in our house. He would follow me wherever I went and pushed me off a chair I was standing on. That's when all the nightmares began. After several weeks of living there, I was in the dining room cleaning. My back was facing the staircase that led to the upstairs. Once you go up the stairs, it's like a little balcony. I suddenly had the feeling that I should turn around. I slowly turned my head and in the corner of my eye, I could see what looked like a little boy. He was dangling his legs between the railing. I quickly turned my head all the way to see who was there, but nobody was. It was just an empty staircase. My whole family was downstairs in the living room too, so it wasn't any of them. I thought I was just seeing things, so I didn't mention it to anyone. The location where I saw this little boy is right outside my bedroom door. Some time had passed and I hadn't seen anything else. Out of the blue, my older sister had admitted to me that she saw what looked like a little kid standing at the top of the staircase close to where I saw him. My mom overheard what we were talking about and told us that she too had seen something. One day she was heading down to the basement. The basement is dark and the lights take a few seconds to turn on. It's also dark down there because there's only one window. She saw what looked like a hunched over man run past the stairs and out of her view. There are closets on both sides of the stairs so they block your view of seeing the whole basement. You can only see straight ahead. If you stood looking down the stairs, you would see the closet with some metal tank thing inside. I think it's for the air conditioner. You can't go in there. Although, in the closet there is a hole that leads to under the stairs. You can't reach the hole because half of it is blocked off with wood. She saw this hunched over man run into that closet. After seeing that, she was too scared to go downstairs for the rest of the day. In our basement is also our laundry room. All the lights in the basement have a delay. My older sister told me that when she walked into the laundry room, she could see the outline of a man standing in the corner. She froze for a few seconds and then the lights turned on and there was absolutely nothing there. She was looking at the shadow when she turned the light on and it just disappeared. Nothing to make a shadow look like a man was there either. My mother also said that she saw a man walk past our back door. He was tall and all she could make out was his silhouette. We have a big sliding glass door. She went to investigate and nobody was in our backyard. Our yard is pretty long and our fences are tall. We also had our dog in the back at the time. He didn't like strangers being in our backyard and he would bark like crazy and jump on them. One night while I was sleeping, my mom woke me up frantically. She asked me if I was humming. I told her that I wasn't humming, I was sleeping, and that I wanted to go back to sleep because I had school the next day. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking up the stairs to go to her room, which is right across from mine, she heard humming. It was soft, slow humming and it sounded like it was coming from my room. She thought she had caught me staying up late, so my mom slowly opened my door. She could make out what looked like a small child kneeling at the foot of my bed, watching me sleep. 
The humming stopped when she turned on the lights, and the figure disappeared too. I told her that I didn't hear any humming, but after that I was too scared to go back to sleep. I don't remember when this happened, but my brother-in-law and my older sister's bedroom is downstairs. He told me that one night, he randomly woke up and didn't know why. That's when he noticed the silhouette of a really tall man standing at the foot of his bed. He didn't really care though and went back to sleep. He told my sister in the morning what he saw and she freaked out. One night when my mom was in her room alone, she heard knocking on her bedroom window. Our rooms are on the second floor. Her window faces the front of the house. The front lawn is on a steep hill. She opened the curtains, but nobody was there. Sometimes, out of the corner of my eye, I can see the silhouette of a tall man standing at the stairs that lead upstairs. But when you turn to look, no one is there. Heavy footsteps can be heard coming upstairs from the basement, but no one is ever there either. The kitchen faucet has turned on by itself twice now. Small things disappear, like utensils. What really scared me the most was when my baby sister, who was three or four at the time, randomly told me one night that there was a man under our bed. Not a monster, a full-grown man. Almost every single night I have a nightmare, and I'm always dying in them. My death is different in every single one. Sometimes I'm murdered, sometimes it's an accident, a natural disaster, natural causes, the list goes on and on. We have smudged the house numerous times. We put cinnamon sticks at every single window and circle the house with salt. The little boy has seemed to disappear. But now we see or hear the man more and more. We've asked our neighbors who have lived here previously, but they don't know. We're all new to the neighborhood. I've tried finding stuff online about our house, but I can never find anything. What should we do? Everybody is too afraid to be home alone. No one likes the basement. I'm scared to leave my room at night. I have a feeling that something is under the stairs, but I know that nothing can get under there. Nobody can fit, except of course for maybe a child. My parents bought a home when I was just two years old, and they owned it until I was 13. From the ages of two to seven, I had countless experiences of the paranormal. Figures, noises, things being moved, people whispering my name, singing, and in true Annabelle style, toys moving on their own while being surrounded in a strange blue light. The experiences above have nothing, and I mean nothing, on those I had later on in life. For a while, my parents were divorced, during which time I rarely stayed in the house, and I always dreaded going there. To my distress, when I was ten, my parents reconciled, and we returned to the home. This is when the true nightmares began. For those who have experienced the paranormal, there's something truly unsettling about feeling like you're not alone, but it's another thing to be touched. Yes, physical contact from something you cannot see, hear, or comprehend has to be the most terrifying thing. Not long after moving back to the house, I was home alone and practicing the piano. The house was a split level, and I was in one of four downstairs rooms. The door to the guest room, where our keyboard was, was closed and there was a window that was near the ceiling. The window was at the ground level of the outside, so if I stood up on the opposite side of the room, I could see the front lawn. The piano was directly under the window, and there I sat playing some mindless scales to warm up. Not long after I started to play, I felt the sense of unease that, ironically, I was rather used to. Figuring it was just that eerie, home-alone feeling that every kid experiences, I kept playing and I didn't stop, until I felt something touch my back. 
too scared to turn around, I looked up to the reflection of the window, which I couldn't see much of from my angle, and I saw nothing. It was dark out, so the window was acting as my mirror, ensuring me that there was nothing there. My mind was clearly playing tricks on me, right? I kept playing. Then, as if I were at the barber, I felt all of my hair be lifted up and sectioned. I looked up again to the window to see the reflection of the tips of my hair floating. At this point, I'm completely frozen and ready to just succumb to my fate. I closed my eyes tight and kept my hands on the piano keys. Almost as quickly as the moment started, it stopped. Although I never felt cold, the room instantly began to get warmer, as if the temperature had been lower, and I reached my hands behind my head. At this point, I felt alone. I felt nobody behind me either, so I was starting to feel better. But when I touched my hair, my heart dropped. My hair was completely braided. Safe to say I dashed out of that room into my neighbor's house until my parents came back. That wasn't the last experience I had there, but it was definitely one of the most visceral. So, I'm employed as a policeman. I work the night shift in a tiny little town. The population here barely breaks a thousand. Needless to say, I know the town well enough to be able to tell when something's off. Near the center of town, there's the old school that they used before they built the new elementary and high schools. The building is listed as a historical site, and the building can't be demolished. But due to asbestos, renovations would cost the town too much for it to be worth the work. The school sits within feet of the public library, and behind sits the town's fairground. It isn't an official fairground, but every year they have bull riding and small childlike shows that they put on in the summer. With all those details out of the way, I'll explain what happened. I noticed the backlight to the library was on, which isn't normal. It wasn't a motion light, and given the time of day, there was no reason for it to be on. I parked on the north side of the old school grounds. I walked through the fence and had to pass the school to get to the library. I would stop every few feet and listen because the gravel was so loud. When I stopped the second or third time, I thought I heard a squeal in the school, like a door. At first I didn't think anything of it since I figured I was just hearing things. The town just replaced all the windows on this building so I thought I wouldn't be able to hear the inside. When I investigated the light and found all the doors locked, I walked back around to my car. As I walked by the school again, I heard a noise in the building once more, and I stopped and listened. I shined my light, noticing that a basement window was broken out. So when I walked up to the window, I looked down in and didn't see anything. I kept walking and I heard the squeal again. It reminded me of those bathroom doors in schools where the hinges always squeaked really loud and echoed. When I came around the corner, I saw two cats roughhousing in the dirt. They stopped to watch me, and then both of them turned and looked at the door that I couldn't see myself because it was around another corner. When they did, one hissed, and then they both bolted away from the school. And this put me on edge. I know this school is absolutely not in use, nor are there any plans to use this school anytime soon. Also, the local kids and homeless don't even go there. It's a landmark that the entire city as a whole really admires. There hasn't ever been an issue with breaking and entering, not for a very long time. So when I came around the corner, I saw the door and walked up to it to see what the cats had run from. I looked for other animals, but that didn't make sense, because they looked up, as if someone was standing in the window of the door, not like where they'd be looking if it was a raccoon or a dog that ran off without me seeing it. When I looked in the window with my light, I could see a gigantic Raggedy Andy painted on the wall. I assumed this was the kindergarten section or something. Then I stepped back from the door, getting ready to leave, and I heard whistling. It wasn't really loud, but it was loud enough to make me stop. 
That little voice in the back of my head was talking now and telling me I was just hearing things. But another voice told me to go back to the door. So I went back and listened again. And I know it was whistling and not like the squeak of an animal or an object from inside. It got louder when I came to the door again. And it had a tune, but I don't know how to describe it. So now, thinking that somebody was in the school, I went around and checked all the doors, including the second floor door that I had to climb the rusty metal stairs that were more like a death trap to get to. When I couldn't find a way into the school, I checked it all over again, and I left. I couldn't figure out what it was. The whistling had stopped, and I even hung out outside for a few minutes with my light on, just watching, figuring somebody was inside and figuring that they would eventually need to use a light to get around or back out. But there was nothing. After 20 minutes or so, I got in my car, circled the block, and parked down the way with my lights off to watch for somebody coming out. But no one ever did, and there haven't been any lights on inside. I know this story seems kind of boring, but working nights can put you on edge. And for all the things I know I experienced before, this was in my top five bone-chilling moments while working. I really wanted to debunk the noise and the cats, but I wouldn't even know where to start with it. I can't explain what happened. I don't know what that noise was or where it came from. All I know is that it shouldn't have been there. <laughs>